Well, good afternoon. It is fabulous to see you, and I so appreciate your interest. Um, I have to confess that the, um, the origin of this autobiographical project that I'm now engaged in comes from you, because I've had various conversations with people, and finally someone put her hand on my arm and said, Jim, are you writing this down? I said, oh, good idea. Thank you so much. So um, the project is really what I think is a kind of, an, uh, of a, a mosaic of highlights rather than a normal autobiography that starts with Charles Dickens being born and continues on. Um, like I guess in, in uh, sports you'd call it a highlights reel, but I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today happened um, in 1963, so we are like 59, and, 59 years and eight months ago is when I'm going to, what I'm going to be talking about actually occurred. Um, and it occurred about three months after I graduated from Harvard, just to give a little background, and six months after my first marriage. Um, I know a number of you know my wife, Rana, with whom I just celebrated. We just celebrated our 40th anniversary. So she's the real one. Um, well, let me begin. So I'm calling this chapter Life Among the Achaeans, which was in one of the ways the ancient Greeks called themselves, also the Hellenes, because they were all supposedly descended from a man named Helle. It's amazing, all that stuff. So part one, arrival. Paros, that's the island for you, the young woman said, looking up from her folder-littered desk at the Cook's Travel Bureau in downtown Athens. It hasn't been discovered, she continued. The island is greener than many, but beautiful, and it has two little towns with stores. It's where some Athenians go in summer, much cooler there. All I knew then about the 30-odd major islands of the Cyclades archipelago, apart from Homer's Odyssey, was the island of Mykonos, which, though lovely, with its sail-driven windmills and seascapes, was already the in-spot for the wanderlust, wanderlust, wanderlust young, mostly German and English, thus holding for me and my first wife, M, little appeal. We stood and thanked her, shaking hands. A few years later, hippies were living in caves in Crete. I hope it works out, she called as we made our way. Travelers checked, turned into several hundred dollars worth of drachma, out to the pleasant end of September sunshine along an avenue of gray stone buildings which only a couple months prior radiated well into the night, oven-like heat from the relentless summer sun. Having traveled all summer across Western Europe, England, France, Austria, Italy, on $5 a day, remember that, in our little fiat, without making plans and certainly no reservations, it didn't seem so strange to add unknown paros to the adventure. Negotiating the five miles of afternoon traffic, we made our way down to the Athenian port of Piraeus, chose a garage whose intendant seemed bemused by what was obviously our lack of knowledge of Greek, of Greeks and of Greece, and was only too happy to take a down payment for an indeterminate number of weeks of storage. Carrying our suitcases and some fruit in a string bag with simple English and hand gestures, we found the appropriate slip among the docks and made ourselves comfortable on a wooden bench to await the boat. Somewhere nearby, 2,000 years before, Socrates encountered and joined up with a group of friends on their way to a religious ceremony. With M's strong knowledge of French, having attended school in Switzerland, and my college German and our general willingness to learn, we had little problem navigating what was for me a maiden voyage to fabled Europe. Having driven down the Adriatic coast of Italy from Venice to Bari, we boarded the huge overnight ferry bound ultimately to Piraeus. We decided, however, to disembark at the first port of call, Igumenitsa, and drive across the Peloponnese itself. The following day, our feet and four small Fiat tires, again solidly on land, we realized in the little town where we stopped for lunch that we couldn't tell a restaurant from a shoe store without awkwardly sticking in our heads. 
nor could we talk with the waiters or read, even read the menu when we finally found one. Esteratorio, restaurant, was one of the first words learned in Greek. Ours was among the few cars that left the ferry for the mainland early that morning. I was still charmed at finally understanding what Homer intended by, quote, the wine-dark sea, meaning, it now seemed to me, not the color of the water, but the intensity of its color, a blue as dark and rich as red wine is red. I must have spent an hour at the back of the ferry as the huge propellers churned up galaxies of brilliant white foam over the deep as wine, blue Mediterranean. Motoring toward Athens, we left the main road to visit the oracle at Delphi, hoping for a good omen from Apollo, golden god of the sun, the arts, and music. But instead of ancient echoes of Zeus's golden sun, in both senses, we encountered the American poet Robert Graves and his film crew. Graves was as surprised to see us at the start of his journey back into the mysteries of mythic Greece at one of the most famous shrines in the, West, in the ancient world as we two newly minted American college grads were surprised to see him. Thinking about the encounter years after, we did converse for a bit. I realized that we had something more in common with the ancient oracle, having been among the early campus partakers of the weed of laughter and forgetting. Archaeologists tell us that the Delphic priestesses, in fact, many oracular priestesses, dance in the smoke of the hemp plant before delivering their wondrously ambiguous pronouncements. In the 5th century BCE, terrified Athenians were relieved to learn from the oracle, the most revered of the whole ancient world, that their city would be saved from destruction by King Xerxes' huge invading Persian army, thanks to what the priestesses, the priestesses called the city's wooden wall, though no one at the time quite knew what that meant. There were no wooden walls. Fortunately, the prophecy held true, at least at first. Two years later, Athens fell to Xerxes' second advance. The city of the Acropolis has certainly survived the vicissitudes of the subsequent two and a half millennia, albeit not with its former glory. After an hour, while we waited and enjoyed the fruit, we watched as a large white vessel rounded the promontory and made its way to the Piraeus dock, having stopped at other islands from which Athenian-bound Greeks were now waving from the railings. The late season navigation was far from a luxury cruise. Farm animals crowded the deck, dogs, goats, chickens in crates, along with sewn-up cloth packages in lieu of suitcases. We stashed our bags among the rest, found comfortable places to sit on the deck among the throng of people and beasts. The ferry chugged, the sun set, the creatures were fed, and we were kindly offered some cheese. Gradually, the darkening sky was spangled with a ridiculous number of stars sparkling in the ever-deepening night. Then it was completely dark, with only a crescent moon and a few weak deck lights. It is increasingly rare in our crowded contemporary times to feel so completely disconnected from a familiar world, entirely dependent on strangers with whom one had no common language other than that of humanity. There was nothing for us to do but wait and wonder as the boat slid between the larger swells of the open Aegean. In the serenity of this night, lost among sea and scars, stars, we might as well have been timeless on the moon. Then, amidst the background murmur of engines and unfamiliar language, I thought I heard the word paros. A deckhand approached and tapped my shoulder, pointing into the darkness beyond the railing. In the distance were two points of electric light, which grew slightly brighter as the ferry grew nearer. The engine slowed to an idle. A deckhand called over the side, and a rope ladder was thrown down. I squinted into the darkness following the direction of the ladder, and below was a small rowboat with two men standing unsteadily in the rise and the fall of the waves. 
awaiting our two suitcases, which were already being handed down. The deckhand then motioned to us. Hearts in mouth, we stepped over the railing and began the descent, clinging for our lives to the rough hemp of the ladder, finally achieving the hardly reassuring rocking little boat. Valedictories were exchanged in what must have been demotic Greek, and the rowboat pushed away. Moments later, there were just a few wooden slats between us and the now much darker than wine and heaving sea. The two men, no doubt fishermen on night duty, pulled their oars in silence, and in the light wind over the water, we reached the base of a concrete dock, illuminated by one of the bare bulbs we had seen from the ferry. The two men lifted us out along with our luggage, at which point the rowboat was secured to a rusting cleat, and the men appeared to have no further interest in two strangers. Hotel? I asked with a silent prayer. The fisherman pointed to the other light we had seen from the boat, up a dusty roadway that led away from the dock, along which we exhaustedly hauled our bags. Several dim, dim lamps in the low curtain reception area illuminated our tired faces. Too tired to inquire further, I paid the taciturn quirk a drachma, 30 cents, for the night's rest in a small room with two beds and Half undressed, we fell instantly asleep to await the dawn and the island where we had thus landed. Two, the Parian landscape. Paros was undoubtedly described on countless parchment scrolls as a center of ancient commerce and culture, and according to some accounts, the birthplace of the goddess Aphrodite as immortalized in Botticelli's amazing painting of the goddess being greeted, arriving from the waves on her clamshell. You know, uh, uh, Aphrodite on the half shell. The preponderance of academic thinking, however, cites a beach on Cyprus as where she touched land. Most of these manuscripts, however, were destroyed in the tragic fire at the Great Library in Alexandria, Egypt. More recently, Paros is honored by the goddess Wikipedia who lauds the island's famed Parian marble. Quote, fine-grained, semi-translucent, pure white, and entirely flawless. Quarried during the classical era on the Greek island of Paros. Some of the greatest masterpieces carved from Parian marble include, appropriately enough, the Medici Venus, the Venus de Milo, and the winged victory of Samothrace. For those of you who've been to Paris, you've probably seen a couple of those. We celebrated our safe arrival to the little town of Parikia with a simple breakfast of bread, divine yogurt from local sheep, butter, creamy local honey, and deep sugary Greek coffee. Thus fortified, we'd ventured out to see where we had arrived. Spread before us under a pale gray sky was the road walked in darkness the night before, which continued beyond the concrete breakwater made of masonry and earth, on which fishermen now set, sat repairing their nets, punctuated by an occasional popping sound, which we learned later was made by octopuses caught in their nets being thrown down onto the concrete mole to tenderize them for the lunchtime repast. The shoreline stretched away beyond the mole, and then in the distance curved back, oops, sorry, creating a bay and a beach. At the center of the bay was a rusting half-sunken ship, stern in the air, plowed bow into the water, the target of German aircraft during World War II. The beach where we were to pass the following weeks of warm, sunny days was reached by the road, become a path that followed the curving sh oops, shoreline. I can't do that anymore. Much closer to where we stood, stood three similar looking houses, more modern than the tumble of square white stucco village buildings. By contrast, these little houses on the shoreline, 100 yards or so beyond the concrete breakwater, featured arched, arched roofs and doorways. Why I imagined anything could come of it, I don't remember. But I walked down and knocked on the nearest door. An advantage of youth is that you don't have enough experience or sense to know when something is impossible. 
I waited. And shortly the door opened. A young, dark-haired woman in shorts and an embroidered tunic smiled and tilted her head. Do you speak English? I inquired. Yes. As it happened, she was an Athenian medical student, greeting me at the entrance to her family's summer cottage from which they had recently decamped for the annual reprise of life in town. Once she understood the reason for my appearance, she was only too happy to rent the house to us for a hundred drachma, thirty dollars, for however long we wanted to stay. She was bound for Athens on the afternoon boat, leaving behind only her brother who lived year-round on another part of the island and who might appear from time to time. But before leaving, she would be able to let him know of our arrangement. Money changed hands. She provided a simple key, and that afternoon, after a lunch of fresh fish and local fruit, we carried suitcases down from the hotel. Thus began our stay on Parian shores, which in a very few days settled into its own timeless rhythm. Although there were a couple of candled lanterns, having no electricity, we lived with the sun. Once rosy-fingered dawn peeked in through the window of our bedroom, the other little bedroom was unexplainedly locked. I would put on bathing suit, t-shirt, and sandals and walk up to town. Along the dusty road on the way back, droplets of water from the small block of ice for the little ice box would slide through the net bag down the outside of my bare leg or fall free, leaving dark dots in the dust of the road. The ice served to keep cool the yogurt, butter, cheese, fruit during this brief transit back to the little kitchen consisting of, if I now remember, a small sink with a cold water spout and a stone counter, a propane stove, a small square table with two wicker chairs, and the ice box, which contained at the bottom a tiny tray to hold the daily refreshment of ice. We were set for another day of sun, ocean, and reading, the Alexandria Quartet, Wallace Stephen, and especially slow time. Sorry. Ah, as it was astonishingly apparent to me a few days later, and after visiting the nearby shrine and birthplace of Apollo on the island of Delos, which is so small I don't think people are living on it, to our earlier issue, um, the Cycladic world is composed of three elements, the sky-filling sun, the rock on which you're standing, and everywhere around you, the dark Aegean, sun, rock, and water, so powerfully elemental that the idea of gods on the snowy crest of Mount Olympus, Olympus is reasonable. You feel so close to the sky you could rise up into it or readily imagine gray-eyed Athena soaring down to greet you in the guise of an owl. This reality drew me in totally. And day following sunny day all but canceled any thoughts of existence elsewhere. We introduced ourselves to the official at the post office who, as our medical student landlady assured us, spoke a little French, very little French. But we were learning sufficient Greek to negotiate purchases or to point to a part of a hanging lamb carcass that looked like something we could cook and eat. Taking a break from beaching, we took advantage of Paros's one official tourist feature, the Valley of the Butterflies, reached by donkeys. The valley was verdant with trees on whose branches swarmed clouds of lovely white wings. This idol, though, held its surprises. Our neighbor, an old woman, all was silent, alone, dressed in black, who appeared wrapped in grief for who knows how many years, unexpectedly approached us one morning. She was clearly agitated and wanted to warn us, namely about the seed pods of the heavenly blue morning glory vines whose deep blue blossoms adorned the concrete walls in the morning of these three little houses. She shook her hands in her head and gestured with her fingers as if plucking and eating the seeds. Oki kala, oki kala, 
not good, not good. In fact, I knew something about heavenly blue morning glory seeds, which were completely sold out at the Cambridge, Massachusetts nurseries my senior year, containing, as has been discovered, naturally occurring delysergic acid, AKA LSD. That spring, a Texan friend of mine and his Mexican sweetie brewed up some heavenly blue tea and disappeared for four days on his motorcycle. No doubt, pursued by dragons and brightly colored birds, flying snakes, and trees that sang as they roared past. I can't say I wasn't tempted, given the peacefulness of the environment, but as I couldn't speak the language and the fact that marijuana took me where I wanted to go, I did forbear. I thanked our old neighbor holding up my hands, F. Harry Stowe, F. Harry Stowe, thank you, indicating we had no interest. She nodded, apparently satisfied she had succeeded in her intent and relapsing into sadness, disappeared into her house. A few days later, walking the wall under the fig trees ripe with fruit, which I picked and ate as we made our way to the beach, we were startled to see two other bathers already there, a blonde young woman sunbathing nude and her apparent mate, a young man in mask, snorkel, and spear fishing gun, already diving along the wreck. After a day of sunshine and shared lunch, we invited Gunther and Ulrike, I don't remember their actual names, to dinner she knew, dining on the fish he had speared that afternoon. Their English was impressive, if Germanically inflected. Encouraged by the lively conversation, our hospitality, and the local Greek Retsina wine and Uzo brandy, Gunther strode around our little room, suddenly suggesting, if we wanted, there is no reason we could not exchange our women's for the evening as we were young and had our freedoms. I could see our women's weren't leaping on board with this, though having enjoyed an afternoon of Ulrike's small Nordic breasts and long legs, I briefly considered the possibility, but better to remain couple friends was the conclusion, especially as M and I had exchanged marriage vows barely six months prior. The German couple only stayed a day or two on Paris, though we remained in following years occasional correspondence and were impressed that they went on to become members of the German parliament. Some years later, Ulrike, separated from Gunther, got back in touch with us and as a result, we enjoyed a visit from their beautiful golden-haired daughter at our floor-through apartment on Horatio Street in Manhattan's still undeveloped, active mead market in the far west village. No Apple store, no High Line, no reservations-only restaurants, high-end boutiques, no, no high-end boutiques or fancy hotels, all waiting to manifest themselves in the dreamy future of the ever-changing Big Apple. Meanwhile, on Paros, surprises continued. A few mornings later, we awoke to see a gaily painted gypsy's wagon parked at some distance in the field behind our house. How it arrived on the island, perhaps from Anatolia, was a total mystery. But if any of the locals were much concerned, they gave no immediate evidence of it. A few hours later, a five-year-old girl, dressed in suggestive black and red blouse, short skirt, gold hoop earrings, red lipstick, and black eyeliner, knocked on our door. Notwithstanding its relationship to familiar Indo-European languages, Romani was not among our talents. We smiled at her flirtatious ways and offered her some, few, some fruit and a few drachma, which seemed to be what she was hoping for. She thanked us with large, dark eyes that had seen more of life than we moneyed and privileged Americans could ever imagine despite our youth and freedoms. I did spend a couple of restless nights concerned that we might be visited by her older relatives with somewhat less friendly aims, but in the end they were good neighbors. A few days later, the bright wagon from which had drifted refrains of song and violin was gone as mysteriously as it had come. A lingering taste from Gunther and Ulrike's visit was our spearfish dinner. Since our arrival, I had been snorkeling along the wreck with its submarine railings, decks, and other features now covered in colorful crusts of sea flowers and coral. 
as languid and equally colorful fish swam about and down into the wreck where I had no intention of following them. So when I saw a spear gun in the little market, I decided to test my mettle. Alas, the fish, gliding fearlessly across my mask-defined line of sight, were just too beautiful. I fired a couple of times, happily missing these totally indifferent creatures. The idea of exploiting their calm, piercing their bodies, causing them anguish, much as I enjoyed eating them when others had taken this step, was too much. For the rest of our stay, the spear gun gathered ancient pariah dust in one corner by the door. The beauty of living with the sun and the beach, day after day, remained intoxicating, but at a deeper level there was a stirring of intent. I had already decided that Rome was where I wanted to try and make a go of it, based on a very indistinct idea of what could possibly provide supportive income. In the quiet of those postprandial afternoons, I studied it in an Italian grammar book in preparation for whatever that might be. Thanks to years of high school Latin, the conditional and subjunctive verb forms were not as daunting as they no doubt are for others, as well as words with gendered endings and articles with which adjectives and verb forms annoyingly had to agree. Why tiger and hand were feminine, la tigre, la mano, was just one of those Italian mysteries. From another perspective, here we were in the middle of the ancient and majestic Aegean, having seen only one island, a waste of opportunity. Checking the ferry schedule, it was clear that we could make a day trip to the nearby island of Naxos, the largest island in the Cyclades, and according, again, to the goddess Wikipedia, the center of ancient Cycladic culture. An ad for the 10 best hotels is currently on Naxos's landing page. An early departure via fisherman's rowboat to the ferry, this time with the sun just up over the horizon, and back to Parian shores again on the 6 p.m. boat, started out the day with promise. I don't remember much about Naxos, probably because of what, just, what happened subsequently. After a day of wandering, we returned to the dock at Naxos, capital, Cora. No rowboat needed for disembarking there, something to be said for being the center of Cycladic culture. We were to await the boat, which never came. By showing them our boat schedule, we learned ah, that we had based our planning on the summer schedule. Mid-October meant the off-season schedule was now in force. As for a hotel, half a century before Wikipedia, there were no hotels in Cora. I can remember having just enough money for a modest dinner and a night's rest. Whether the establishment was a flop house or one of ill repute or both, I was never sure. Certainly conversations among many voices lasted well into the night. The beds we were invited to sleep in consisted of hammocks suspended on two lateral ropes, which were one untied at 6.30 a.m. and lowered to the floor, whether or not you were awake. <laughs> the last of our drachma dispersed for coffee and bread, we spent the morning just wandering aimlessly around the city awaiting salvation. Perched on a hill finally above the harbor, we watched with relief as the fall scheduled afternoon boat moved into view. Brushing the cycladic dusk from our now well-worn clothes and preparing to descend and join the milling crowd on the dock, to our amazement and their great surprise, we watched as the bow of the ferry hit the concrete slip with a boat-shaking jolt. From our perspective up the hill, it was an, as if a termite nest had broken open, people scrambling and running and yelling. The boat groaned into reverse, and we all waited to see what disaster might occur, a slow sinking, a lengthy repair, spending our winter on Naxos, no money, no passports, you know how easily the mind runs off to disaster scenarios. But in the end, the harbor captain with his team of white uniform men surveyed what turned out to be certainly a dent in the bow, but to the relief of all, nothing that would keep the vessel from being seaworthy. Once on board, we sat on the deck in the afternoon sunlight, stoned on relief. Paros arose like a miracle, floating on the wine-dark waters, 
and the fisherman's rowboat was our luxurious carriage ride home. The next few days were spent savoring our island paradise and its inviting beast across the bay. Um, let's see. A few days later, however, we awoke not to warmth and sunlight, but to cool air and fog, sending us scurrying for sweaters. Unexpectedly, a long, old-fashioned motor yacht was in the harbor, carrying, we learned that morning, the prince of Greece. There was still royalty in Greece. On a mission of goodwill to the islands and his island subjects. On the shielded deck, a young man in dark blue sweater and tailored white trousers could be seen acknowledging the fishermen, repairing their nets. I guess you do it this way. This autumnal visitation, however, was an omen that the time had come for us to take our leave. After the amazing days and nights spent arriving and living on Paros, the return to Piraeus, mole to rowboat to ferry to port, all in cool daylight a few days later, was, seemed normal. I now had a grasp of the basics of Italian grammar and what future might await in Rome, which took pride of place in my mind over the Greece all around me. The garage attendant in Piraeus seemed not surprised to see us, calculating the balance owed as if the car had only been left a few days before. I have no memory of taking the ferry from Piraeus to Bari, nor the drive across the south, oops, south of Italy to Caput Mundi, the center of the world, Rome. My next memories are of late October sunlight splashed on ochre walls of the Roman buildings and the overwhelming sense that this city was incomprehensibly familiar. But that will take some more explaining. 